All right, hello everyone, welcome back. I'm your friend in SXO. Um, today uh, we are going to continue our mass learning, and for now we are going to get into the complex numbers. You know, when I first hear about this word complex numbers, I have no idea what it is. Uh, because I guess even I have learned this concept, I probably never use it, so it's kind of useless. But by the way, uh, let's get into it and say what it can be used. In this video, I want to introduce you to the number i, which is sometimes called the imaginary imaginary unit. And what you're going to see here, and it might be a little bit difficult to fully appreciate right from the get-go, that it's a, a more bizarre number than some of the other wacky numbers we learn in mathematics, like pi or e. And it's more bizarre because it doesn't have a, a tangible value in the sense that we're normally used to defining numbers. i is defined as the number whose square is equal to negative negative 1. This is the definition. This is the definition of i. And it leads to all sorts of interesting things. Now some places you will see i defined this way. i as being equal to the principal square root of negative 1. I want you to just point out to you that this is not wrong and it might make sense to you. You know, if something squared is negative 1, then maybe it's the it's the principal square root of negative 1. And so these seem to be almost the same statement. But I just want to make you a little bit careful. When you do this, some people will even go as far as saying this is wrong and it actually turns out that they are are wrong to say that this is wrong. But when you do this, you have to be a little bit careful about what it means to take a principal square root of a negative number and it being defined for imaginary and as we'll learn in the future, complex numbers. But it, for, for your understanding right now, you don't have to differentiate them. You don't have to split hairs between any of these definitions. Now, with this definition, let's just think about what the different powers of i are. Because you can imagine, if something squared is negative 1, if I take it to all sorts of powers, maybe that should give us all sorts of weird things. And what we'll see is that the powers of i are kind of neat because they kind of cycle, or they do cycle, through a whole through through a set of values. So I could start with let's start with i to the zeroth power. And so you might say, hey, look, anything to the zeroth power is one. So i to the zeroth power is one, and that is true. And you could actually derive that even from this definition. But this is pretty straightforward. Anything to the zeroth power, including i, is one. Then you say, okay, what is i to the first power? Well, anything to the first power is just that number times itself once. So that's just going to be i, really by the definition of what it means to take an exponent. So that completely makes sense. And then you have i to the second power. i to the second power, well, by definition, i to the second power is equal to is equal to negative 1. Let's try i to the third power. I'll do this in a color I haven't used. i to the third power. i to the third power. Well, that's going to be that's going to be i to the second power times i. And we know that i to the second power is negative 1. So it's negative 1 times i. To make it clear. This is the same thing as this, which is the same thing as that. i squared is negative 1. So when you multiply it out, negative 1 times times i will write as negative i. Now what happens if we take i to the fourth power? I'll do it. I'll do it up here. i to the fourth power. Well, once again, this is going to be i times i to the third power. So that's i times i to the third power. i times i to the third power. But what was i to the third power? i to the third power was negative i. This over here is negative i. And so i times i would give you negative 1. But you have a negative out here. So it's i times i is negative 1. And then you have a negative. That gives you positive 1. That gives you positive. Let me write it down. So this is the same thing as, so this is i times negative i, which is the same thing as negative 1 times, remember, multiplication is commutative. If we're just multiplying a bunch of numbers, we can switch the order. This is the same thing as negative 1 times i times i. i times i, by definition, is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is equal to 1. So i to the fourth is the same thing as i to the zero power. Now let's try i to the fifth power. i to the fifth power. Well, that's just going to be i to the fourth times i. And we know what i to the fourth is. It it is 1. So it's 1 times i, or it is just i again. And so once again, it is exactly the same thing as i to the first power. Let's try, and just to see the pattern keep going, let's try i to the seventh power. Sorry, i to the sixth power. i to the sixth power. Well, that's i times i to the fifth power. That's i times i to the fifth. i to the fifth, we already established, is just i. So it's i times i. It is equal to, by definition, i times i is negative 1. And then let's finish off. Well, we could keep going on this way. We can keep putting higher and higher powers of i here, and we'll see see that it keeps cycling back. And in the next video, I'll teach you how taking an arbitrarily high power of i, how you can figure out what that's going to be. But let's just verify this cycle keeps going. i to the i to the seventh power is equal to i times i to the sixth power. i to the sixth power is negative 1. i times negative 1 is negative i. And if you take i to the eighth, once again, it'll be 1. i to the ninth will be i again, so on and so forth. Uh, you know what? It 
that makes sense. So at the beginning, what I did is to tell you a bunch of uh, definitions for the complex number. For example, as you know, the i is the imaginary unit and the i squared equal to negative 1 and the i itself equal to uh, negative 1 squared. Also, yeah, some, something like that. Um, oh, but he didn't tell you why we need the imaginary numbers. We're asked to simplify the principal square root of negative 52 and we're going to assume because we have a negative 52 52 here inside of the radical that this is the principal this is the principal branch of the complex square root function that we can actually put input negative numbers in the domain of this function that we can actually get imaginary or complex results so we can rewrite negative 52 as negative 1 times 52 so this can be rewritten as the principal square root of negative 1 negative 1 times negative 1 times 52 and then if we assume that this is the principal branch of the complex square root function we can rewrite this this is going to be equal to the square root of negative 1 times the principal, or I should say the principal square root of negative 1 times the principal square root times the principal square root of 52. Now, I want to be very, very clear here. You can do what we just did. If we have the principal square root of the product of two things, we can rewrite that as the principal square root of each, and then we take the product. But you can only do this, or I should say, you can only do this if either both of these numbers are positive or only one of them is negative. You cannot do this if both of these were negative. For example, you could not do this you could not say you could not say the square root of it or the principal square root of 52 is equal to negative 1 times negative 52 you could do this so far I haven't said anything wrong 52 is definitely negative 1 times negative 52 but then since these are both negative you cannot then say you cannot then say that this is equal to the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 52 in fact I invite you to continue on this train of reasoning you're gonna get a nonsensical answer this is not okay this is not okay you can cannot do this right over here and the reason why you cannot do this is that this property does not work when both of these numbers are negative now with that said we can do it if only one of them are negative or both of them are positive now the principal square root of negative 1 if we're talking about the principal branch of the complex square root function is I so this right over here does simplify to I and then let's think if we can simplify the square root of 52 any and to do that we can think about its prime factorization see if we have any perfect squares sitting in there so let me so 52 is 2 times 26 and 26 is 2 times 2 times 13 so we have 2 times 2 there or 4 there which is a perfect square so we can rewrite this as equal to this is equal to well we have our i now square root of the principal square root of negative 1 is i the other square root of negative 1 is negative i the principal square root of negative 1 is i and then we're going to multiply that times the square root times the square root of 4 times 13 4 times 13 and this is equal to and this is going to be equal to i times the square root of of 4 i times the square root of 4 or the principal square root of 4 times the principal square root of 13 the principal square root of 4 is 2 so this all simplifies and we can switch the order over here this is equal to 2 times the square root of 13 2 times the principal square root of 13 I should say times i times i and I just switched around the order it makes it a little bit easier to read if I put the i after the numbers over here but I'm just multiplying i times 2 times the square root of 13 that's the same thing as multiplying 2 times the principal square root of 13 times i and I think this is about as simple simplified as we can get here all right so um from this video so far i haven't said anything wrong from this video at least we know one thing which is if, if you have let's say if you have um sorry okay so uh if you have a form like this uh, you could always split it into two terms of formula and you can do this if uh, the, the root square of that value, that value is composed by a negative value and a positive value, or uh, both of them are positive value. If that condition is true, then you could apply this kind of thing to split it into two parts. Now that we've seen that, that as we take i to higher and higher powers, it cycles between 1, i, negative 1, negative i, then back to 1, i, negative 1, and negative i, I want to see if we can tackle some, I guess you could call them trickier problems, and you might see these surface, and they're also kind of fun to do, to realize that you can use this, the fact that i, the powers of i cycle through these values, you can use this to really, on a back of an envelope, take arbitrarily high powers of i. So let's try, just for fun, let's see what i to the 100 powers. And the realization here is that 
100 is a multiple of 4. So you could say that this is the same thing as i to the i to the 4 times 25th power. And this is the same thing, just from our exponent properties, is i to the 4th power raised to the 25th power. Right? If you have something raised to an exponent and then that is raised to an exponent, that's the same thing as multiplying the two exponents. And we know that i to the 4th, that's pretty straightforward. i to the 4th is just 1. i to the 4th is 1, so this is 1. So this is equal to 1 to the 25th power, which is just equal to just equal to 1. So once again, we use this kind of cycling ability of i when you take its powers to figure out a very high exponent of i. Now let's say we try something a little bit stranger. Let's try i to the, let's try i to the 501st power. Now in this situation, 501, it's not a multiple of 4, so you can't just do that that simply. But what you could do is you could write this as the product of two numbers, one that is a multiple, one that is i to a multiple of 4 power, and that one it isn't. So you could rewrite this. 500 is, is a multiple of 4. So you could write this as i to the 500th power, i to the 500th power, times i to the first power, right? You have the same base. When you multiply, you can add exponents. So this would be i to the 500th power. And we know that this is the same thing as i to the 500th power is the same thing as i to the 4th power. 4 times what? 4 times 125 is 500. So that's this part right over here. i to the 500th is the same thing as i to the 4th to the 125th power. And then that times i to the first power. Times i to the first. Well, i to the 4th is 1. 1 to the 125th power is just going to be 1. This whole thing is 1. And so we are just left with, we are just left with i to the first. So this is going to be equal to i. So it seems like a really daunting problem, something that you would have to sit and do all day. But you can use this cycling to realize, look, i to the 500th is just going to be 1. And so i to the 500th, 1, is just going to be i times that. So i to any multiple of 4. Let me write this generally. So if you have i to any multiple of 4. So this right over here is, well, we'll just restrict k to be non-negative right now. k is greater than or equal to 0. So if we have i to any multiple of 4 right over here, we are going to get, we are going to get 1. Because this is the same thing as i to the 4th power to the k power. And that is the same thing as 1 to the k power, which is clearly equal to 1. And if we have anything else, if we have i to the 4k plus 1 power, i to the 4k plus 2 power, we can then just do this technique right over here. So let's try that with a few more problems, just to make it clear that you can do really, really arbitrarily crazy things. So let's take i to the 7,321st power. Now, we just have to figure out this is going to be some multiple of 4 plus something else. So to do that, well, you could just look at it by sight, that 7,320 is divisible by 4. You can verify that by hand, and then you have that 1 left over. And so this is going to be i to the 7,320 times i to the first power. This is a multiple of 4. This right here is a multiple of 4. And I know that because any 100 is a multiple. Any 1,000 is a multiple of 4. Any 100 is a multiple of 4. And then 20 is a multiple of 4. And so this right over here will simplify to 1. Sorry, that's not i to the i power. This is i to the first power. 7,321 is 7,320 plus 1. And so this part right over here is going to simplify to 1. And we're just going to be left with i to the first power, or just i. Let's do another one. i to the i to the 90, i to the 90, 90. Let me try something interesting. i to the 99, i to the 99 power. So once again, what's the highest multiple of 4 that is less than 99? It is 96. It is 96. So this is the same thing as i to the 96 power times i to the third power, right? If you multiply these, same base, add the exponent, you would get i to the 99 power. i to the 96 power, since this is a multiple of 4, this is i to the 4th, and then that to the 16th power. So that's just 1 in the 16th. So this is just 1. And then you're just left with i to the 3rd power. And you could either remember that i to the 3rd power is equal to, you could just remember that it's equal to negative i. Or if you forget that, you could just say, look, this is the same thing as i squared times i. This is equal to i squared times i. i squared, by definition, is equal to negative 1. So you have negative 1 times i is equal to is equal to negative i. Let me do one more, just, to, just for the fun of it. Let's take i to the 38th power. Well, once again, this is equal to i to the 36th times i squared. I'm doing i to the 36th power, since that's the largest multiple of 4 that goes into 38. What's left over is this 2. This simplifies to 1, and I'm just left with i squared, which is equal to negative 1. Yeah, so uh, in this way, we could uh, somehow decrease the complexity of uh, imaginary units uh, to convert it into uh, some smaller number, something like that. Uh, then we are going to get into the complex numbers. Most of your mathematical lives, you've been studying real numbers. Real numbers include things like 0 and 1 and 0 0.3 repeating and pi and 
I could keep listing real numbers. These are the numbers that you're, you're kind of familiar with. And then we explored something interesting. We explored the notion of, well, what if there was a number that if I squared it, I would get a negative one. And we defined that thing that if we squared it, we got negative one. We defined that thing as i. And so we defined a whole new class of numbers, which you could really view as multiples of the imaginary unit. So imaginary numbers would be i and negative i and, and pi times i and e times i. So this might raise another interesting question. What if I combined imaginary and real numbers? What if I had numbers that were essentially sums or differences of real and imaginary numbers? For example, let's say that I had the number, let's say I call it z, and z tends to be what we, the, the most used variable when we're talking about what I'm about to talk about, complex numbers. Let's say that z is equal to, is equal to the real number 5 plus the imaginary number 3 times i. So this thing right over here, we have a real number plus an imaginary number. And you might be tempted to add these two things, but you can't. It, it, it won't make any sense. These are kind of going in different, well we'll, well, we'll think about it visually in a second, but you can't simplify this anymore. You can't add this real number to this imaginary number. A number like this, and let me make it clear, that's real, and this is imaginary, imaginary. A number like this, we call a complex number. Com, a complex number. It has a real part and an imaginary part. And sometimes you'll see notation like this, where someone will say, well, what's the real part? What's the real part of our complex number z? Well, that would be the 5 right over there. And then they might say, well, what's the imaginary part? What's the imaginary part of our complex number z? And then they'll tell, and then typically the way that this function is defined, they really want to know, well, what multiple of i is this imaginary part right over here? And in this case, it is going to be, it is going to be 3. And we can visualize this. We can visualize this in two dimensions. Instead of having the traditional two-dimensional Cartesian plane with real numbers on the horizontal and the vertical axis, what we do to plot complex numbers is we, on the vertical axis, we plot the imaginary part. So that's the imaginary part. And then on the horizontal axis, we plot the real part. We plot the real part, just like that. We plot the real part. So for example, z right over here, which is 5 plus 3i, the real part is 5. So we would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 5 right over there. The imaginary part is 3. 1, 2, 3. And so on the complex plane, on the complex plane, we would we would visualize that number right over here. This right over here is how we would visualize z on the complex plane. It's 5, positive 5 in the real direction, positive 3 in the imaginary direction. We could plot other complex numbers. Let's say we had the complex number a, which is equal to, let's say it's negative 2 plus i. Where would I plot that? Well, the real part is negative 2, negative 2, and the imaginary part is going to be, you can imagine this is plus 1i, so we go 1 up, it's going to be right over there. So that right over there is our complex number, our complex number a would be at that point of the complex, complex, let me write that point of the complex plane. Let me just do one more. Let's say you had the complex number b, which is going to be, let's say it is, let's say it's 4 minus 3i. Where would we plot that? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then, let's see, minus 1, 2, 3, or negative 3 gets us right over there. So that right over there would be the complex number b. Mm, again, what I did is to, or negative 3, okay, is to tell us what is complex number. I mean, what, what's the form uh, which makes a complex number, but uh, which is a real part and an imaginary part? But he didn't tell us what is that, why we need that. He didn't show us any of those uh, ideas. Now that we know a little bit about the imaginary unit i, let's see if we can if we can simplify more involved expressions like this one right over here. 2 plus 3i plus 7i squared plus 5i to the third power plus 9i to the fourth power. And I encourage you to pause the video right now and try to simplify this on your own. So as you can see here, we have various powers of i. You could view this as i to the first power. We have i squared here. And we already know that i squared, i squared is defined to be negative 1. Then we have i to the third power. i to the third power would just be i times this, or negative i. And we already reviewed this when we first introduced the imaginary unit i, but I'll do it again. i to the fourth power is just going to be i times this, which is the same thing as negative 1 times i, that's i to the third power, times i again. i times i is negative 1, so that's negative 1 times negative 1, which is equal to 1 again. So we can rewrite this whole thing. We could rewrite it as 2 plus 3i. 7i squared is going to be the same thing. So i squared is negative 1. So this is the same thing as 7 times negative 1. So that's just going to be minus 7. And then we have 5i to the third power. i to the third power is negative i. So this could be rewritten as negative i. So this term right over here, we could write as minus 5i or negative 
to 5i, depending on how you want to think about it. And then finally, i to the fourth power. i to the fourth power is just 1. So this is just equal to 1. Um, all right. So what I did here is just to, to uh, give us an idea about how can you compose uh, the real part to real part and the imaginary part to imaginary part. So in the end, you would just simplify the, I say you would just simplify the whole formula into a simple formula, which was composed by one real part and one imaginary part. This is what this video used for. Yeah, and, and even more, you could, uh, let's say, add or subtracting two complex numbers. We're asked to subtract, and we have the complex number 2 minus 3i, and from that, we are subtracting 6 minus 18i. So the first thing I'd like to do here is to just kind of get rid of these parentheses. So we just have a bunch of real parts and imaginary parts that we can then add up together. So we have 2 minus 3i, and then we're subtracting this entire quantity. And to get rid of the parentheses, we can just distribute the negative sign, or another way to think about it, we can say that this is negative negative 1 times all of this. So we can just distribute the negative sign, and negative 1 times 6 is negative 6. Let me do these in magenta. So this is negative 6, and then negative 1 times negative 18i, well, that's just going to be positive. Positive 18i. Negative times a negative is a positive. And now we want to add the real parts, and we want to add the imaginary parts. So here's a real part here, 2, and then we have a minus 6, so we have 2 minus 6, and we want to add the imaginary parts. We have a negative, that is color. We have a negative 3i right over here, so negative 3i or minus 3i right over there, and then we have a plus 18i or positive 18i, and then we have a positive 18i. If you add the real parts, 2 minus 6 is negative 4, and you imagine add the add the imaginary parts, if I have negative 3 of something, and to that I add 18 of something, well that's just going to leave me with 15 of that something, or another way you could think about it, if I have 18 of something and I subtract 3 of that something, I'll have 15 of that something, and in this case the something is, the ima is i, is the imaginary unit, so this is... So this is going to be plus 15 plus 15i, and we are done. 15 plus 15 okay, so um, I. the whole thing is still quite simple. You just have to find those uh, real part, real number part. For example, those numbers that doesn't have the i symbol inside of it. Then you're gonna find out all those imaginary part, which is those, those parts that includes the i symbol inside of that. And when you compose them together, you get the final answer. This is quite simple. Uh, you can even doing the multiplication for the complex numbers. We're asked to multiply the complex number 1 minus 3i times the complex number 2 plus 5i. And the general idea here is you can multiply these complex numbers like you would have as like you would have multiplied any traditional binomial. You just have to remember this isn't a variable. This is the imaginary unit i, or it's, or it's, or it's just i. But we could do that in two ways. We could just do the distributive property twice, which I like a little bit more just because it actually you're, you're doing it from a fundamental principle. It's nothing new. Or you could use FOIL, which you also used when you multi when you first multiplied binomials. And I'll do it both ways. So you could view, you could view, this is just a number, 1 minus 3i. And so we can distribute it over the two numbers inside of this expression. So when we're multiplying it times this entire expression, we can multiply 1 minus 3i times 2 and 1 minus 3i times 5i. So let's do that. So this can be rewritten as 1 minus 3i times 2 times 2, right, 2 out front, plus 1 minus 3i plus 1 minus 3i times 5i times 5 I. All I did is a distributive property here. All I said is, look, if I have a times b plus c, this is the same thing as a b plus a c. I just distributed. I just distributed the a on the b or the c. I distributed the one minus three i on the two and the five i. And then I can do it again. I have a um. So let's say when he when he talked about this, you know, a times b plus c equal to a b plus a c. Uh, you know, back to then, when I say this kind of formula, I have no ideas. I mean, uh, no programming ideas. But for now, I got some ideas from the programming uh, re respect view. For example, um, now when I say this, I, I would say the B and C as a last of elements. Then what A did is to multiply each element in that last, for example, A, B, and A, C. That's kind of like that, right? Right. So um, in the end, if you could convert all those mathematics problems into the, in, into the programming problems, then we can solve those uh, um, complex mathematics problems problem without any um, error or um, complexity because th that's that's the programming and uh, that's something that is solvable and you, you can do those kind of things step by step easily.
2 now times 1 minus 3i. I can distribute it. 2 times 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times negative 3i is negative 6i. And over here, I'll do it again. 5i times 1, so it's plus 5i times 1 is 5i. And then 5i times negative 3i. So let's be careful here. 5 times negative 3. Let me just 5 times negative 3 is negative 15. Negative 15. And then I have an i times an i. Right? I'm multiplying 5i. Let me do this over here. 5i times negative 3i. This is the same thing as 5 times negative 3 times i times i. So the 5 times negative 3 is negative 15. And then we have i times i, which is i i squared. Now, we know what i squared is. By definition, i squared is negative 1. i squared, by definition, is negative 1. So you have negative 15 times negative 1. Well, that's the same thing as positive 15. So this can be rewritten as 2 minus 6i plus 5i. Negative 15 times negative 1 is positive 15. Now we can add the real parts. We have a 2, and we have a positive 15, so 2 plus 15. And we can add the imaginary parts. We have a negative 6. We have a negative 6, or negative 6i, I should say. And then we have plus 5i, so plus 5i. And 2 plus 15 is 17. And if I have negative 6 of something plus 5 of that something, what do I have? If I have 5 of that something and I take 6 of that something away, then I have negative 1 of that something. Negative 6i plus 5i is negative 1i, or I could just say minus i. So in this way, I just multiplied these two expressions, or these two complex numbers, really. I multiplied them just using the distributive property twice. You could also do it using FOIL, and I'll do that right now really fast. It is a little bit faster, but it's a little bit mechanical, so you might forget why you're doing it in the first place. But at the end of the day, you are doing the same thing here. You're essentially multiplying every term of this first number, or every part of this first number, times every part of the second number. And FOIL just makes sure that we're doing it. Let me just write FOIL out here, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I'll do it, just in case that's the way you're learning it. So FOIL says, let's do the first numbers. Let's multiply the first numbers. So that's going to be the 1 times the 2. So 1 times the 2. That is the f in FOIL. Then it says, let's multiply the outer numbers times each other. So that's 1 times 5i. So plus 1 times 5i. This is the o in FOIL, the outer numbers. Then we do the inner numbers, negative 3i times 2. So this is negative 3i times 2. This is, those are the inner numbers. And then we do the last numbers, negative 3i times 5i. Negative 3i times 5i. These are the last numbers. So that's, that's um, yeah. The, the, the form FOIL is just what I have learned back to my Chinese classroom. Um, they, they, uh, they attend to tell us this rule, but never tell us why, why it is that. But, uh, for now, um, I don't know, it's just a, it's just a stupid formula to, uh, memory and, and then it then give you the idea of the general distribution rule. Quadratic equations with complex solutions. What is that? We're asked to solve 2x squared plus 5 is equal to 6x. And so we have a quadratic equation here, but just to make it, put it into a form that we're more familiar with, let's try to put it into standard form. Standard form, of course, is a form ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. And to do that, we essentially have to take the 6x and get rid of it from the right-hand side, so we just have a 0 on the right-hand side. And to do that, let's just subtract 6x from both sides of this equation. And so our left hand side becomes 2x squared minus 6x minus 6x plus 5 is equal to, and on our right hand side, these two characters cancel out, and we just are left with 0. And there's many ways to solve this. We could try to factor it, and if I was trying to factor it, I would divide both sides by 2. If I divide both sides by 2, I would get integer coefficients on the x squared and the x term, but I would get 5 halves for the constant. So it's not one of these easy things to factor. We could complete the square, or we could apply the quadratic formula, which is really just a formula derived from completing the square. So let's do that. In this scenario. And the quadratic formula tells us that if we have something in standard form like this, that the roots of it are going to be negative b plus or minus, so that gives us two roots right over there, plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over over 2a. So let's apply that to this situation. Negative b, this right here is b. So negative b is negative negative 6. So that's going to be positive 6. Plus or minus the square root of b squared. Negative 6 squared is 36. Minus 4, minus 4 times a, which is 2, times 2, times c, which is 5, times 5, all of that over 2 times a. a is 2, so 2 times 2 is 4. So this is going to be equal to 6 plus or minus the square root of 36, so let me just figure this out, 36 minus, so this is 4 times 2 times 5, this is 40 over here, so 36 minus 40, and you already might be wondering what's going to happen here. All of that over 4, or this is equal to 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 4, right, 36 minus 40 is negative 4, 
4 over 4. And you might say, hey, wait, Sal, negative 4, if I take a square root, I'm going to get an imaginary number. And you would be right. The only two roots of this quadratic equation right here are going to turn out to be complex. Because we're going to get, when we evaluate this, we're going to get an imaginary number. So we're essentially going to get two complex numbers when we take a positive and negative version of this root. So let's do that. So the square root of negative 4, that is the same thing as 2i. We know that's the same thing as 2i, or if you want to think of it this way. Square root of negative 4 is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4, which is the same. Well, I could even take do it one step. That's the same thing as negative 1 times 4 under the radical, which is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4. And the principal square root of negative 1 is i times the principal square root of 4 is 2. So this is 2i, or i times 2. So this right over here is going to be 2i. So we are left with x is equal to 6 plus or minus 2i over 4. And if we were to simplify it, we could divide the numerator and the denominator by 2. And so that would be the same thing as 3 plus or minus i over 2. Or if you want to write them as two distinct complex numbers, you could write this as 3 plus i over 2, or 3 halves plus plus 1 half i. That's if I take a po the positive version of the i there. Or we could view this as 3 halves minus, minus 1 half, minus 1 half i. This and these two guys right here are equivalent. Those are the two roots. Now what I want to do is verify that these work. Verify that these two roots. So this one I can rewrite as 3 plus i over 2. These are equivalent. All I did, you can see that this is just dividing both of these by 2. Or if you were to essentially factor out the 1 half, you would get either, you could go either way on this expression. And this one over here is going to be 3 minus i over 2. Or you could go directly from this. This is 3 plus or minus i over 2. So 3 plus i over 2. Or 3 minus i over 2. This and this, or this and this, or this. These are all equal representations of both of the roots. But let's see if they work. So I'm first going to try, I'm first going to try this character right over here. It's going to get a little bit hairy because we're going to have to square it and all the rest. Let's see if we can do it. So what we want to do is we want to take 2 times this quantity squared. So 2 times 3 plus i, 3 plus i over 2 squared plus 5. And we want to verify that that's the same thing as 6 times this quantity, as 6 times 3 plus i over 2. So what is 3 plus i squared? So let me. So this is 2 times, let me just square this. So 3 plus i, that's going to be 3 squared, which is 9, plus 2 times the product of 3 and i. So 3 times i is 3i, times 2 is 6i, so plus 6i. And if that doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to kind of multiply it out, either with distributive property or FOIL it out. And, and you'll get the middle term will be, you'll get 3 times 3i twice. When you add them, you get 6i. And then plus i squared. And i squared is negative 1, minus 1. All of that over 4, plus 5 is equal to, well, if you divide the numerator and the denominator by 2, you get a 3 here and you get a 1 here. And 3 distributed on 3 plus i is equal to 9 plus 3i. 9 plus 3i. And what we have over here, we can simplify it before I, just to save some screen real estate. 9 minus 1 is 8. So if I get rid of this, this is just 8 plus 6i. 8 plus 6i. We can divide the numerator and the denominator right here by 2. So the numerator would become 4 plus 3i if we divided it by 2. And the denominator here is just going to be 2. This 2 and this 2 are going to cancel out. So on the left-hand side, we're left with 4 plus 3i plus 5. And this is e needs to be equal to 9 plus 3i. Well, you can see we have a 3i on both sides of this equation. And we have a 4 plus 5, which is exactly equal to 9. So this solution, 3 plus i, definitely works. Now let's try 3 minus i. 3 minus i. So once again, just looking at the original equation, 2x squared plus 5 is equal to 6x. Let me write it down over here. Uh, uh, all right, that's kind of overwriting. So uh, what I did here is, is just, um, you know, by calculating out the, the, the solution for the x by using the um, standard formula. For this case, that would be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2, 2a. That by, by using that kind of formula, he somehow gets the solution of of this equation. So after he gets the x representation, what he did is to simplify it. And in the end, what he did is to uh, simplify the, the root square formula into the complex the number for, uh, into the complex number form, uh, which is uh, something that contains the i symbol or contains the symbol i. Um, then uh, what he did is to uh, put those answers that he get into the original equation, and if that equation is true, then that means his solution is correct. Actually, that's all this video was talking about. All right, so basically this is the end of today's mathematics learning, and inside of this video we have learned about the concept of complex numbers, especially 
uh, the definitions for the complex, the, 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 the equation definition or something like that. Um, but for the real meaning of complex number, he, the other didn't tell us we can do a search. Let's say complex number. Why we need complex number? That's essential. Okay, it is said that if the formula provides a negative in the square root, complex numbers can be used to simplify the zero. Complex numbers are used in electronics and uh, whatever. A single complex number puts together two real quantity, making the numbers easier easier to work with. So, uh, basically, uh, they created this concept is to simplify the calculation when they when when the calculation involves the square roads or the, the the negative number under the square root i guess that's why they they invade this concept called complex number they just want to simplify the calculations when they have to work with some uh, negative square root i guess that's it um so um this is today's video and i'll see you guys in the next one bye